What's going on, guys? Beauty and the Beast. It went beast mode at the box office, and you're seeing it everywhere. Buses, billboards, TV commercials, Emma Watson, here, there, everywhere. And it got us nostalgic. We did an honest trailer of 1991's animated film, Beauty and the Beast. But one thing that a lot of people are asking, does Belle suffer from a mental condition known as Stockholm Syndrome? We mentioned it for like two seconds in the Honest trailer, and then you guys wouldn't stop talking about it. So we set out to see if this might be the case and if any of the other Disney princesses suffer from mental conditions. Enjoy this deep dive into the psychology of Disney. I'm here with Dr. Romani Dervasala, professor of psychology at Cal State LA and licensed clinical psychologist. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thanks for sitting down with us. Thanks for having me. One of the main contentions about Beauty and the Beast is that Belle suffers from Stockholm Syndrome. The whole idea of Stockholm Syndrome has actually been debunked in the literature. So this idea of one falling in love with a captor, that, that entire phenomenology has sort of been left by the wayside. What we do though have is a dynamic that concerns me because he is in fact her captor, yes. he is abusive, he is sort of always yelling and running around the castle being quite a little grumpy beast, and she falls in love with him, this idea that her love can rescue him from his anger. Mm -hmm. That's one of the reasons I've always had so much trouble with Beauty and the Beast. However, it's ironic that from the mouths of babes, it was my 13-year-old daughter who said, I think you're being too harsh, Mom, because I really think it's a movie about maybe not judging a book by its cover. I understand what she's saying, and she said, Mom... Yeah, a big, hairy, ugly guy can find love. Exactly. What do you got against big, hairy, right. ugly but guys? But here's the problem. Okay. The big, hairy, ugly guy, yeah. you fall in love with him, and then he still turns into sort of your garden-variety handsome prince. Yeah. If it really was that kind of, I love him no matter what, he would have stayed big, hairy, ugly That's guy. called Shrek. <laughs> <laughs> now, so let me ask then, what would you diagnose the beast with? I mean, the beast definitely feels like a narcissist until he's not, right? Then he becomes a sweetheart and he starts being a loving guy. My concern there is that in many narcissistic relationships, people keep waiting for the narcissist to turn around and become a sweetheart. Oh, that yeah. never happens in real oh, life. Oh yeah, I can fix him. I yeah, can you fix can. her. Trust yeah. me, if I can't with all my big guns, you can't either. May I posit one more potential diagnosis for Belle? Okay schizophrenia <laughs> because she sees candlesticks and silverware coming to life. Or substance abuse. She yeah. could have been using LSD. Yeah, she maybe. could have been using MDMA. Yeah. I mean, you know, which meant oh. her and the beast might have had better sex. So what are the, but, right? Let's talk Gaston. Ah, uh, Gaston. A bit of a bully. Is yes. he compensating for something? What's the root of his severe narcissism? All bullies are compensating for something. Keep uh -huh. that in mind. There's no need to be a bully unless you feel like there's something lacking, right? Why do you need to go around sort of bouncing around? In fact, wasn't he more of a beast than the beast and he was the handsome and, guy? And that something lacking could be either like, oh, um, I don't like the size of my yeah. or I was never good enough to satisfy daddy. Exactly, and yeah. that's usually what it is. It is those mm -hmm. daddy issues or mommy issues that yes. I am not good enough. So when you feel like you're not good enough and you feel that empty inside, you're always overcompensating with this sort of grandiose entitled personality. I'd love to shift gears and talk about Sleeping Beauty and Snow White. Mm -hmm. Is a desire to kiss sleeping people normal, problematic, some kind of psychosis? That's or? a real problem for me with Snow White. In fact, I gotta tell you, Snow White is a close second to Beauty and the Beast for a story that I really malign in sort of the entire Disney pantheon. So what's that as a dating guide? Fall asleep and you'll meet the man of your dreams? Yeah, also, is this teaching our young men to go around and kiss sleeping women? Mm, not okay. I'd like to talk about Peter Pan and his titular syndrome. Yes. I just wanted to say the word titular. What? Is Peter Pan syndrome and does Peter Pan suffer from it? Well, Peter Pan syndrome is the idea of the man who wants to stay forever a child in oh. every way, you know, that, which, which I hits, thought was in hits, fact all men. That hits but home. there's something moderately creepy about it because, like, really childish. Like, they still have action figures in their package at home, like okay. that sort of Peter yeah. Pan. So I'm hoping yeah, that's not a personal that? criticism. Let me ask you this uh, day drinking, Peter Pan syndrome? Day drinking may actually be alcoholism. Okay, moving on. I'd like to talk about the movie Aladdin, hmm. a classic, yeah. the genie, Robin Williams' classic role. Classic role um, yeah. He spends thousands of years locked alone in a lamp. What 
kind of trauma would that long-term isolation cause? And uh, does the genie show any signs of trauma? Solitary confinement is actually one of, uh, is a premier form of torture. And in fact, it is, it is a punishment used in prison systems and in military systems. But it's interesting, when the genie gets released, he's quite manic, right? He's yes. talking very quickly, yeah. he's moving, <laughs> exactly. There's this real mania about the genie. And oh, so yeah. it does make you wonder how, you know, maybe that that's also one of the symptoms too. Like his, his thoughts are racing, he has pressured speech. A lot of the symptoms of mania we see pressured in genie. Pressured speech. Pressured speech is when you're talking very quickly, sometimes not making sense and no one else can get a word in edgewise. One of those places. No substitutions, exchanges, a refund. <laughs> Dr. Dravasala, let's talk about fabled story Pinocchio. Ah, uh, yes. He clearly shows signs of being a pathological liar. Oh. What's underlying beneath the surface? Given that Pinocchio was a child, Mm -hmm. Pathological lying can be associated with things like we call conduct disorder. Conduct disorder is often sort of the, the chapter one, you know, sort of the preface to what we call antisocial personality disorder, mm. which is often popularly termed psychopathy or being a psychopath. And you know, Freud would have had a field day with Pinocchio. Sometimes a I'm cigar just is just a cigar, sometimes a nose is just a nose. Oh, okay. So Pinocchio's nose growing is like a wish fulfillment yes. for a... Uh, and it's a whole Oedipal thing, yeah. You get what I'm doing. Yeah, he's trying when to. When I whistle, I'm talking about a penis. Okay, well you could just say penis too. Oh no, I would never say penis. I'm not gonna say penis. I say I'm it a lot. I'm just gonna whistle. Give a little whistle. Let us venture under the sea, if you will. Let's do it. And talk about the Little Mermaid. Ariel shows clear signs of hoarding. And uh, I'm wondering, is this symptomatic of something else? Why does one hoard? It seems more like she's a collector than a hoarder. You know, kids love to collect stuff. Mm -hmm. That's not an uncommon and like behavior action like action. Kids, children, not grown men. I mean, so, but these are. I mean, they're not toys. They're collectibles. You can call them whatever you want. They're yeah, still a grown man with an action figure. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So I think that you know Ariel and all her collecting. That is a very child childlike pursuit and she's a child in some ways in, in essence mm -hmm. but she's it's also covetous I mean she sort of covets this other place so it's almost like somebody I don't know collecting whatever things from another part of the world that they want to travel to that's what it sort of feels like there's something poignant about it rather than her being sort of a, a person who collects like has like raccoons walking through her house or something she longs to be up on the land where the people are right how how does someone go about integrating into society having never met a human being? It's a really good question. In some ways, Ariel's story is an immigrant's tale, isn't Ooh. it? It is very difficult to integrate into a new world yeah. and, you know, and to get your voice and your legs. And in essence, those are interesting metaphors in that. And so that's really what it's about. It's not easy. Ask anyone who's moved to a new country, especially one where they don't speak the language. Mm -hmm. And she was, remember, she was rendered silent when she first came to land because her voice was taken away. Yes. So she couldn't speak, she couldn't communicate in her new land. Mm. So I really do think that that's very difficult to do. Let's talk about Walt Disney. I wonder what it says about him that so many of the Disney films involve dead parents yeah. or the death of a parent. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now keep in mind the loss of a parent. I actually don't know enough about Walt Disney's own early history to wonder if what kinds of parental issues he had, mm -hmm. but it does make me wonder if there was some sort of separation or loss that was sticking with him for that theme to come up. Those are the stories he yeah, chose to in these early maybe movies. Maybe his uh, dad went out to get a pack of smokes and never, and came, never back. came back. Yeah. I don't know, but there's something That's going a on there. Time, yeah. Am I right? yeah, it is. Yes, it is. Now, let me ask you this. Does Disney give young girls unhealthy notions of what it means to grow into a woman? I do worry that it does because although Disney started getting a little bit more progressive and we're seeing more progressive sort of princess type figures, yeah. Moana is a great example. Moana. Moana is my favorite princess because she's a leader, she's heroic, and she doesn't have a love interest. Mm -hmm. In almost every other Disney film, even Mulan, which features a warrior, there's still a guy, there's still a, you know, a love guy. Disney films filled with classic villains. Mm, lots of villains. Some of them probably have psychological issues. I'd say most of them. Villains always have psychological issues. That's why they're villains. I'm going to name a villain, and I would love it if you could give us a simple diagnosis. Okay. Cruella de Vil, 101 mm. Dalmatians. That's psychopathic. To murder all those dogs to make a coat? And she wanted to keep killing them. I don't think any piece of clothing is ever worth harming a defenseless creature for. Yeah, that's true. From Aladdin, Jafar. Ooh, Jafar. 
again a psychopath. Philpins in general are psychopaths, uh -huh. but in his case, he had a um, absolutely focused obsession with power. So there's a real obsessional piece. Scar from The Lion Ooh, King. There's another psychopath, and he's a murderer. Yeah. Well, I mean, Cruella Deville's a murderer too. She killed all those dogs, but Scar killed his own brother. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's fratricide. Ursula. Oh, Ursula. The mermaid. Ursula covets. That covetousness is very much not only a part of narcissism, but also, again, being a psychopath. And Ursula doesn't feel bad about taking Ariel's voice. Again, it's the lack of remorse in all of these villains that comes back. Narcissists sometimes feel bad when they do bad things, like you. But psychopaths don't feel bad. They just do bad things, and then they just go home and eat a pizza, and they're fine with it. Did you just call me a narcissist? I hinted. We may need to talk more. And there's still that action figure problem. Do you have any appointment times open for her later? I'm pretty full up for the next few weeks, but I bet we can get you in next month. Okay. okay. Dr. Romani Dervasala, thank you for diagnosing these Disney princesses. I feel like we've learned a lot, and uh, I unexpectedly learned more about myself than I wanted to. Sounds like a win. Thank you. Thank you, doctor. Well, that was fun. I want to say thanks again to Dr. Diversala for putting up with our shenanigans, but I am still wondering what that Peter Pan syndrome thing is. I'm a grown man. By the way, guys, we want to hear from you. We want to answer your questions in an upcoming segment that we call Dear Screen Junkies. What kinds of questions? All kinds of questions. Stuff about movies, stuff not about movies, just about life marital advice, favorite pizza toppings, who knows? I may regret saying this, but anything goes. Check out the description below for how to contact us and then send us your questions. I wanna thank you for watching Screen Junkies. I'm Hal Rudnick, hit me up on Twitter. Bye-bye. Hey guys, did you know that this end card works with your phone now? I know, right? Click the boxes below to watch more Screen Junkies videos and click the Screen Junkies logo to subscribe and get this show, honest trailers, movie fights, and more.